start recording. Nothing's happening. Ah, now it is. OK, so welcome. This will be the 91390, the thermochemistry. On Wednesday will be the organic and on Thursday will be the aqueous. I will send out emails in each case, including the recording of the previous lesson. So after this one, I'll send out the email for the Wednesday um, lesson plus the recording of this one. Now, um, when you do the 91391, uh, 90, which is the thermochemistry, you only need to get nine achieved opportunities, and some years it's less, sometimes it's only seven, in order to pass. So it should be easy enough to pass if you just focus on a few key things. But I'm sure all of you that are here are not just interested in passing, you want to do a lot better than that. So I will also go over key points that you need um, in order to get a merit and an excellence. OK, um, I heard something ding, so I just want to check um, that everything is OK there. OK, right, so the first question that normally comes up when you open the exam paper is an electron configuration. And these are always an achieved opportunities, Occasionally, you know, what I've just done here is I've just taken screenshots from past papers. So you'll notice all of them are in question one, apart from in 2020, it was actually in question three. So if you open the exam paper and you go, oh, where are the electron configurations? I was hoping to start with that. Uh, it may just be in another question. So um, I always suggest open the exam paper, have a quick skim first, and do the things that you find really easy. So the key things for the electron configuration is if you look, there's normally three options of, and you normally need to get two correct in order to uh, get your first achieved point. Remember, you only need nine. Um, if you stuff this up, you can still get merit and excellence, but it's a very easy achieve point. So you'll see for all of them, you just need two of them. Um, you do sometimes, you'll notice in 2017, they made it slightly more complicated. And therefore, if you got the whole table correct, you got uh, a merit point for that. So here you had to work out just not just the electron configuration. Um, you also were given, say, the charge and you had to work backwards. So they didn't say like Fe2 plus over here or Mn2 plus. They told you it was a charge, but they told you it was the atomic number. So you are given a resource booklet where um, you have the periodic table. Now this, sorry, I should have, um, oh, it's always bang in the middle. Um, you, this one's a more complicated one, but please use it. So if you're told it's an atomic number of 20, okay, you look for the 20 over here, and therefore you know it's calcium. And if it's calcium with a positive charge of two, then it's not 20 electrons, it's 20 minus two is 18 electrons. Um, the other question that is commonly asked, can you use uh, the abbreviated ones a version? Yes, you can. You can use either the long version or the abbreviated. I myself prefer the long version because it means if you take all the numbers, hopefully you can all see that these numbers aren't too small. If you take the 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 6 is 18, plus 3 is 21, plus 2 is 23, then you can check on the periodic table for vanadium, because that's just a neutral compound of vanadium. Um, it should have 23. So use the periodic table to get the right number of electrons and then double check. Um, the only other thing that I want to say here is if you've got a transition metal, so like manganese, you always lose from 4S first. So 4S gets completed before 3D, but 4S is also emptied first before 3D. Um, so don't take from 3D first. So you'll notice the MN2 plus doesn't have any 4S electrons. Any questions on 
electron configuration. It's for ions only, Beth, but it's for the transition metal ions because the transition metal ions are the only ones where, you know, you've got a 4S and a 3D. Um, if you had go beyond that, so like bromine, for example, they won't be losing electrons. They'll be gaining electrons and so it'll be going the other way. So it's only the transition metal that will be an issue. Okay. Um, Right, so check the charge, especially something like copper, Cu plus. Don't be tricked into the normal Cu2 plus. They told you specifically Cu plus. And again, that electron will be removed from 4S before 3D. So you'll notice there's no 4S over here. Um, and sorry, I just, what's an easy way to memorize how to figure them out? For me, it's you just use the periodic table. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Now, the only trick when you use a periodic table is this middle block has dropped by a row. So this is four, this is the 4s row, as you can see with that 4 over there. But this will now. Um, go to 3D and then it carries on with 4P. Now there was another ding here, so I'm just uh, right, hopefully I've let everybody in. <laughs> so does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, so going back to this, as I say, this should take you two minutes and it's an, an easy achieve point. OK, what usually follows after this, but doesn't always, there has been an exception, is uh, the trend. So normally they ask you some sort of electron configuration and often from that electron configuration or sometimes completely different ones, they will ask you in some way something about the trends for atomic radius, ionic radius, um, electronegativity, and first ionization energy. So this always goes to excellence. Um, <clears throat> oh, I have put the wrong answer in here. I will correct it and send out the link. This, this is not the right answer. This is all about polarity. And uh, it's not about selenium and calcium. So uh, I will fix that. <laughs> I was throwing this together. Um, notice if you are good with maths and you enjoy maths, then a good way when explaining trends is, um, if I just scribble on here, is if you uh, learn this or, or just sort of this is the formula for Coulomb's law so if you do physics you would have come across it uh, which is basically a constant which you don't have to worry about but then it's the charge of one times the charge of the other divided by the distance between them squared so why I'm pointing this out is whenever you are um, trying to explain the force of attraction or repulsion you are looking at the charge on the valence electron. So a charge on a valence electron always stays the same. This is the charge of the nucleus because that's the attraction, the, the attraction between the nucleus and its outermost electron. And the distance between them is also important. So the bigger the distance between them, the smaller the force of attraction because can you see it's F is proportional to one over D squared. And notice this is D squared. So distance is really important. So make sure you discuss distance and we'll go over the model answers and you'll see distance comes up. Um, the other aspect is of course, how big the charge on the nucleus is. The charge on the outermost electron is always the same charge an electron, uh, but the charge in a nucleus varies according to the number of protons. 
and then also how much shielding is around it. So therefore, how much the outermost el electron will feel that charge from the from the nucleus. So if you have a look over here now, um, is this big enough to see or not? Q2 was just the, the other charge. So to say the charge on the nucleus, one one charge. So one Q is a charge on the valence electron and the other charge or well, the other thing is on um, the, the, the nucleus. So those are the two attractions, a positive uh, elect, uh, nu uh, nucleus and a negative electron. So here you can see we've got the same number of protons. So the nuclear charge will be the same. OK, um, however, because it the atom loses, remember an ion never loses electrons, an atom loses the electrons to form the cation. Um, it goes from three occupied energy levels to two occupied energy levels. And therefore, if you think of that normal sketch, if that's the nucleus, that's the first energy level, the second energy level, and the third one, can you see if you had your valence electron there for the magnesium, those now get removed to form the Mg um, Mg2 plus ion, so your valence electron is now here. So they are closer and therefore it's going to be smaller. Okay, so it didn't specifically spell it out there, so you'll notice this is only for, for ions that normally only goes to a merit explanation. Um, the other ones will go to excellence. So if you look over here, um, we've got uh, the charge, so we've got the nucleus, so we've got um, something about charge there, so the number of protons, that's the increasing charge, we now have this bit about the increasing distance. So always discuss the charge, the number of protons, the amount of shielding compared to uh, the distance between them. And if you've got the full uh, explanation, you'll get excellence. Note um, for an achieve point, remember we're looking for nine achieve points. Uh, it, if you asked about ionization energy, you often are also asked for the equation, or sometimes you just simply have to uh, define ionization energy. So learn those basic definitions, and they, those are easy points. You know, you don't have to understand anything. You just have to regurgitate that for achieved. Uh, but notice here, again, you get every one of these bullet points is an achieved point. Every one of these bullet points here is a merit point or an excellence point. So if you get both of these, but you didn't get that, you would already have two achieve points plus your first one that you got for your electron configuration. Now, you must include states always. All level three equations include states. So you'll notice there are states here. And ionization energy, remember, is the loss of an electron. So even if you had something that normally gains electrons, like oxygen or so on, it's always going to be O in the gaseous atom going to lose an electron, so therefore it'll always be O plus in a gaseous, and there is the electron that's been removed. Okay, so that's the ionization energy and um, equation. So always electron on that side, one positive, and include, it'll always be gaseous. So no matter what element you've got, whether it's a metal or anything, it's always gaseous. <clears throat> OK, and again, this is it's you've got to have something about the attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons. So the further away they are, the smaller the attraction. Um, the more bigger the nucleus, I mean, or the more protons in the nucleus, the bigger the attraction. So what I suggest you do in preparation for the exam is to look at this document. Well, once I fix that. 2021 one, look at it and highlight the key words to see how they answer. And then you practice it. Because quite frankly, it's easy to get an excellence if you just sort of practice the style. So another way to try and remember um, 
the sort of style. If you look in the 3043, I've got the uh, in the revision lesson. If I just bring it up just from here. Um, sorry, I'm just going to get it up quickly. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry about this. I should have had it, but it is in uh, the last lesson before the teacher marked assignment. Uh, there's a little video associated with it to, so that you can see how to do it. Here are what I've uh, given nine um, explanation type questions. Um, so, for example, uh, so these are, I mean, the first one's periodic trends, Lewis structures, they don't go up to excellence level, uh, but shapes and bond angles go up to excellence level, polarity of molecules. So basically, I've given a whole lot of questions, and then here you can print these out. Uh, if you do them back to back, then uh, these are all the questions. And then on the other side is an example. It is quite a few pages. I will say there are 18 pages, so you can choose the ones that you really want to focus on. So here's an example about the periodic trends. So these are questions you can ask. Are the numbers of protons increasing of the two given elements that you've got to compare? So therefore, is a nuclear charge increasing? Obviously, if the number of protons are increasing, the nuclear charge is increasing. And then you've got to look on the other side in terms of distance. Are they going the electrons in the same energy level or are they in different energy levels? Therefore, it's further away or closer. Um, and then you've got to talk about the shielding because the further away the electrons are, the closer, uh, sorry, the more inner electrons they are, which simply cause more repulsion amongst the electrons. So the outermost ones don't feel that same effect of the nucleus. And therefore, we talk about effective nuclear charge. And just going very, very briefly, then here are the uh, answers to that question. So because it's back to back, it's opposite. So this is the first one, that's the second one, that's the third one, this is the fourth one, and so on. So I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, uh, A, you asked, do you have any suggested websites or YouTube videos for studying? Um, I really recommend No Brain Too Small. Uh, Learn coach is okay, but sometimes their chemistry is a bit wonky, so I don't like that too much. Um, and then there is study it as well that you could use. But I find no brain too small pretty useful uh, for getting summary notes. But again, the more summary notes you make yourself, the more likely you're going to remember. So I would strongly re recommend that you go over it. So no brain too small. If I just simply Google it, um, so no brain too small, you can see it comes up. You want level three chemistry, or if you couldn't see that, you know, they've got it up here. You want the level three, and then the one we're doing at the moment is the thermochemistry. Um, so what they've got is a whole lot of sort of um, last minute reminders, but again, it's better you make your own. Um, summary of question occurrence, so it's more or less what I've got here, but it's done in a different way. And if you wanted to um, look at, uh, the, then they've actually made their own question paper, so if you want more practice, they've got more over there. But say you wanted to revise atomic structure and bonding or so on, um, you know, they've, they've got sort of uh, collated questions. OK, so this is all the shapes and of um, um, molecules and polarity questions, etc. OK, so going uh, back, so that's the second question you'll always get, or the second part of the question, first electron configurations, then you'll always have something on trends. OK. The next one, you can see there's a lot on trends. OK, so that's normally a whole question. There may be something else thrown in. You may get a trend in terms of a graph. So you'll notice here they've done it in a graph, ionization energy is going from beryllium to um, 
barbarium. So again, you would look at the periodic table and go, okay, this is the question that's talking about the group. So don't talk about period when they're asking you just about the group. So use your periodic table. Um, another sort of way they can ask it is they can ask you, um, okay, something like this. Sometimes they might actually uh, give you, say, the oxygen, sodium, and sulfur, or oxygen and sodium, uh, and give you the values and say which value fits with which. In other words, is oxygen going to have the 3.4 or is the sodium going to have the 3.4 electronegativity? So you've got to know your trend. You know, oxygen and sodium on the same period, but oxygen's on the right-hand side, sodium's on the left-hand side, so the right-hand side is more electronegative. I know in the in the camera you're going to see the opposite left and right to me, <laughs> but uh, so therefore oxygen will have that. So there are different ways they could answer this. So it's good to go through those collated questions just to see the various ways. But basically, once you come down to it, it's the, exactly the same explanation they want every single time. So you can practice that. Okay, right. Next one, Lewis structures. This invariably comes up just like electron configurations. You get given two uh, compounds and you've got to draw the Lewis structure and name the shape. And this normally goes up to merit. And it's usually if you get two correct, so if you get, say, uh, this and this correct, or if you got that and that correct, then you would get an achieve point. So you've got now at least three achieve points. Okay. <clears throat> Um, sometimes they will ask it in slightly different ways, but this is the standard one. You'll notice they'll always tend to give you a neutral compound and then an iron, because when they do the iron, they want to see, will you include the square brackets and will you include the charge? So it could be a cation or an anion, but you can see they'll tend to ask that because they want to know the square bracket and the charge. Um, and you see the cation, I mean, sorry, SF4 neutral, SF3 minus. Uh, in 2018, they were both neutral. Um, and then in uh, 2017, they actually asked you one, which was an iron. So you had to have the iron um, square brackets. If you leave out the square brackets and the charge, it's not correct. But here, what they had done, because it wasn't two separate bits, you could actually get um, the correct Lewis structure, and then that was another part of the question that came up later. Any questions about Lewis structures? For, okay, for Lewis, how, how do you draw diagrams if there are no... Um, Okay, they will never give you for this part ethanol because, as you say, do you choose um, you know you've got C C O. I'm leaving out the H's. Um, you could theoretically make any one of these the central atom because I could sort of say, well, it does have an H and two lone pairs attached. So that will be like a bent shape over here, whereas here, this is a tetrahedral. So they'll they'll never ask you something that has got more than one possible one. Okay, so, I mean, we would, you can't actually say this is tetrahedral or not. Okay, because it's you could focus on say th this carbon two is on the tetrahedral shape and carbon one is on the tetrahedral shape or the oxygen is the bent shape, but you can't actually say ethanol is, you know, tetrahedral or something like that. So you'll notice there will always be, uh, you, you know, you notice the I. There's nothing going beyond that. Uh, the Fs they all at the end points. You you can't so you can't make F the central atom. Uh, again, use the periodic table in terms of 
the central atom, so if they gave you like COCl2, for example, then you go, do you have to draw C uh, in the middle or O in the middle? Because you said COCl2, so does O go into the middle? The one with the highest valency is always in the middle. So carbon is in group 14. Remember group one, two, oh, there it is, 14. Group 14 means it has a valency of four. So it can have four bonds. And so it's more likely to be in the middle because it can make four different bonds. Oxygen is in group 16. So it only has a valency of two. Because remember valency is the combining power. Hydrogen is a combining power of one, beryllium of two, or group two. Group three, group, um, I mean, three valency, four valency, three valency, two valency, one valency, no valency. So no combining power. Um, okay, so I hope that helps in terms of trying to work out which one goes into the middle. Meth, uh, Beth, sorry, uh, I'm a little confused with the drawing of the R3 structure. Can you explain it? Okay, so if I go back to here. Um, what you've got to work out is you go, OK, I've got I3. So I've got three iodines. So I have got um, seven times three, which is 21 electrons, plus the charge. Um, so plus the charge, so it'll be uh, 22 electrons. So you always just sort of draw one of those iodines must be in the middle. So the other iodines must to each side. Now you've got to put in those 22 electrons. So two of those go in this bond, two of those go in that. So we've got 18 left. So you always fill the outside first. So now we're down to 16. Now we're down to 14. Now we're down to 12. Now we're down to 10. Now we're down to eight. Now we're down to six. So we've got now six electrons left. We can't put them on the outside because they've got the octet. So we have to put it on the inside. Now, remember, if they below, if they're below that row two, so anything from here onwards, which can access D electrons, anything over here onwards, downwards, can form more than an octet because they can access those D orbitals. Um, and so we've got to put the six electrons around here. So we've got one pair, so we're now down to four, another pair, and then the final pair. So this means, if I just change that color because it's getting really messy, I've got one, two, three, four, five pairs of electrons or five regions of um, negative charge. Um, so yes, you've got that five regions of uh, negative charge around the central atom. That's correct. Now, um, and the reason why you, you don't have four regions of charge is because iodine, if they've, it's got too many electrons, it can access those D orbitals and therefore go more than four. Um, this is considered nonpolar. And the reason being is if I sketch this out, it is linear. So we've got um, a bond, well, we don't actually have really, a, well, we have actually a slight bond dipole simply because this is more negative because this central iodine has got 10 electrons compared to the outermost ones who only have got eight. So this one is slightly more negative than the outermost ones. OK, very slight, but it is there. But it's overall nonpolar because uh, this, if you like, bond dipole, or the, here I wouldn't use the word bond dipole because it's iodine and iodine. Um, so I would just simply say there's a, a symmetrical distribution of electrons around the central iodine atom. Um, these are all in what we call the equatorial area. So if you think of that's the axis, and then uh, for trigonal bipyramidal, you've got one up and down, and then you've got three going in the middle. So I'm trying to make the one go into the page. So this bit in the middle is equatorial. So all the lone pairs are sitting 
in this equatorial zone. They're not bonds, so they're not going to affect anything. And the two bonds are directly opposite each other. And therefore, any polar effects um, is going to cancel out. So this is definitely going to be nonpolar. Okay, don't be fooled in thinking because it's got a negative charge that it must be polar. It can be ionic, but be nonpolar. Okay, so anything below the D energy level, yes. So the ones that cannot uh, access the D are um, these ones over here and those over there. Um, so even potassium and calcium don't access the D. But anything from here onwards can go back. Oh, these could. They, they're sitting. They, they, because they, this is the third energy level, the D are sitting empty because they're slightly higher in energy. But if they had to push for it and use up a bit of energy, they can access these empty D orbitals. Yep, so beryllium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine can't because they're only in the second energy level and the D are just, 3D are just too far away. Uh, but these can if pushed. Okay. Right. Um, let's carry on because oh, we're halfway and we've only done three things. So let's carry on. Um, again, what I would recommend, so I've given you like notes to improve your answers. So have a look at the answers you've done in the past and think of what you didn't get right. So what you've got to remember for the future. The more you process the information the, yourself, the more you're going to remember. Okay, polarity. This will always be an excellence. And here's the answer. Sorry, I mucked up. This is now the, the trends one and not the shielding, uh, not the polarity. But you'll see that they are always the same sort of things. You've got to discuss electronegativity difference. So please make sure you talk about electronegativity difference. You don't have to specifically state which one is more electronegative than another, but because you have got two different elements, AS and F. Okay. Uh, you know, if you don't know AS is arsenic, then just, you know, just say AS. <laughs> okay. Then because they're different elements, they will have different electronegativities. So you are going to have polar bonds. So that's always like your first statement. Then your second statement is where you're talking now about the shape of the electron geometry and the shape of the molecule. Um, also note you should include here is if you've got um, two different elements or not attached to the central one. Because can you see that ASF5 lands up to be nonpolar, okay? But if I had ASF4Cl, would that be polar or nonpolar? So if I drew this, okay, um, you would look in the pure periodic table to see where AS was. So it's in group 15, so it's going to have five electrons. So it's got five electrons plus uh, 35 from the fluorine or here fluorine and chlorine. So we've got 40 electrons in total. So we've got, first of all, our F, F, um, F, F, F. They actually draw it for you. Um, perhaps I should just go over here. They will always give it to you. Now notice they draw it like this, which isn't quite the shape. Remember, I drawn mine like this, where I did axial and equatorial. Okay, so you've got three of them in the equatorial plane, one above and one below. This is going to be nonpolar because although we've got polar bonds, the shape is a, a symmetrical. So all the bond dipoles will cancel each other and the AS is only bonded to F. However, if I had AS bonded to 
a chlorine as well, where we've replaced a chlorine, a fluorine with a chlorine, would this bond dipole be the same as these over here? And therefore, will they all three cancel each other out? So an ASCL, will that be the same size bond dipole as an ASF? You've got a 50% chance of being uh, right. Yep, no, they would, it will not be the same because it's got a different electronegativity. And hopefully you'd, you'd know that because you know from electronegativity trends, this one's the most electronegative and it decreases on the way down. So the ASCL bond is going to have a smaller electronegativity difference than an AS fluorine bond. And therefore, even though the shape is trigonal by pyramidal, okay, for both of them, the bond dipoles will not cancel. Um, so that's the next step uh, that you would have to talk about. And notice for, and then the final thing is basically you've got to talk about in terms of shape that they are, those areas of negative charge uh, are repelling each other to form that trigonal bipyramidal shape. Um, just as a note, a lot of students talk about areas of electronegativity. I see that again and again and again. Be very careful of using a science term if you don't know the meaning, or if you've written the term, tell yourself what is the meaning of that term, because electronegativity is the uh, a measurement of the attraction an element has to a bonding electron. So it's an attraction measurement. Is it an area? Can it be a region? And hopefully you'll say no, because an attraction is not a region. So you can't have a region of electronegativity. You can have though a region of electron density or a region of negative charge or even electron clouds as they've got here. But notice how if you just explain that there was a difference in electronegativity um, or you spoke about how many areas of ne negative charge were around the central atom, you'd get an achieved point. And notice um, it's always you've got to have pretty much everything for excellence. Um, the way they work, there's normally two excellence opportunities per question, sometimes three. You've got to get both perfect for an E8, and you can, if you just miss out really on one of those excellence, you just didn't drop you all the way down to merit, but it wasn't quite what they wanted, you get an E7. So in other words, if you got most of this, but not 100%, you'd land up and you got the other excellence opportunity for this question, you'd get an E7. Okay, if you got both of them perfect, with everything there, then it's an E8 for that question. Okay, so um, as I say, it's always electronegativity, then discuss the shape, what that central atom is bonded to, whether the bond dipoles cancel, and therefore is it a polar or a non-polar molecule? And then um, this question had asked you actually also about the shape, so compare and contrast the shapes and polarity. So that's another ex uh, good um, exam technique is go and highlight or underline, because you don't really have highlighters in an exam. I mean, you can take them in, but it's easier just to underline with your pen. When you've written your answer, go back and see, did I discuss shapes completely? If I didn't, go and write some more. Did I discuss polarities completely for both of them? Then you can tick that off. So underline and then go back when you've done your answer and tick it off. If you haven't, can't tick it off, then go and write some more. Um, unless you're sitting all three exams and then you might be a bit tight for time to do. Um, but you'll notice here's the same sort of thing in terms of the shape and the polarity. Notice how they always start off with how many regions of negative charge or electron clouds or electron density around the central atom. So always start with that. 
a lot of students will start off with the number of bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs. You've got to explain very clearly it's got six bonding pairs and therefore it's going to have an octahedral electron geometry. OK, they didn't say it here. They give the bare minimum here. Um, but, you know, it's got an octahedral electron geometry. And of those six regions, five of them are bonding and one is a lone pair. And therefore, it's going to be square pyramidal shape. OK, but notice they always in all of these things, they always dis discuss the repulsion. So you must have that statement. OK, and then in terms of polarity, um, as I say, they always give the bare minimum the assessment schedule. So you can always give more, but notice they talk about the electronegativity difference. Therefore, the bonds are polar. They say polar covalent, so do polar covalent. And therefore, um, are those bond dipoles arranged symmetrically or asymmetrically around the um, central atom? And therefore, would they cancel or not? And therefore, what is the molecule, polar or nonpolar? So it's a pattern that is very easy to learn. You know, you just need to practice it a bit. Right, so that is um, in terms of polarity. OK, so you'll see it's always that same sort of thing goes up to excellence. Now, this is another one that's guaranteed to come up and that's the intermolecular forces. And they can ask this in different ways. They can give you the delta H of EP, or they can give you the um, boiling point. They mean pretty much the same thing, although one of course is a temperature and degree centigrade and the other one is the energy in joules. Uh, but basically what they're saying is how much energy is needed to separate all the particles of that species, uh, that's the delta H VAP, or what is the temperature where enough energy has been supplied where you, all the particles are separated. So the smaller the H VAP or the lower the temperature, the less energy is needed. Now it's really important that you very clearly state the three different types of intermolecular forces, and that is the temporary dipole, all molecules have temporary dipole forces of attraction. Okay. Sometimes they'll throw in ionic compounds or something like that here. So just be careful. But if they're molecules, they will all have temporary dipole forces of attraction. If they are polar, then they will have permanent dipole as well dipole force of attraction. And for some of them, they will have um, hydrogen bonding. Now, this particular one, what they've got here is, and you can pick it up immediately by this enormous number. And another way you can pick it up is hopefully you can see calcium is a metal and bromine, well, bromide comes from bromine, is a non-metal. So whenever you have got a metal bonded with a non-metal, you know, on opposite sides, what type of bonding have you got? OK, it'll be ionic bonding. So whenever you've got metal with a non-metal, it's ionic bonding. If you've got uh, non-metals bonded together, then it'll be covalent bonding. Um, within the, if it's forming molecules, it'll be within the molecule, and then the attractions between molecules will be intermolecular forces. If you've just simply got metals, so sodium or calcium or something like that, it'll be metallic bonding. So this is obviously doesn't have have the temporary dipole force of attraction. This will be the straightforward ionic bonding, and this is of course a much stronger than the intermolecular forces, so that's why it's got a really high boiling point. So you've got to point out that this consists of ions, therefore ionic bonding, and um, it will have lots of attractions between the ions and therefore lots of energy needed to break it. When you're looking comparing molecules, you've got to look at these. Now there's no hydrogen in any of these, so you don't have hydrogen bonding here. 
Okay, intramolecular bonding is the bonding that exists between atoms in molecules, correct? So when polar substances, okay, uh, NaCl is not polar. NaCl is ionic. So we only refer to polar when we're talking about molecules. And NaCl is not a molecule because it's not non-metal. It's a metal combined with a non-metal. Uh, so that's just check with that. So you'd say uh, when ionic substances such as NaCl dissolves in water to form, it doesn't form ions, NaCl is already ionic. If you had, for instance, ammonia, ammonia is um, a, a molecule and in water it can form ions. So that would that's a polar molecule that can form ions. Um, yep, but yeah, so for anything that dissolves, you break the intermolecular forces, not the intramolecular. Covalent bonds are never broken. When you have NaCl, then you have broken the ionic bonds, correct? So if we've got NaCl, uh, those are it's already ionic. We just don't put the charges in because NaCl overall is neutral. And as I always say, chemists are lazy. So we never write something if we don't have to write it. And that's why we don't write Na1Cl1, you know, uh, but we would say, say, calcium Cl2 because we have to write the two, but we don't write the CA1 because we're lazy, so we just leave it out. The same thing with the charges. We don't bother putting in the charge because they say, well, sodium chloride is neutral overall, but it does consist of cations and anions. Okay, so here when sodium chloride dissolves, we're breaking a whole lot of ionic bonds because we've got sodium and chloride ions all over the place. So we're breaking all these ionic bonds um, and creating new bonds, because breaking bonds takes energy. The new bonds that release energy, you know, where that energy comes from, will be from the new bonds, which is between the water. So this is what we call an iron dipole, because this is an iron, and that is a polar molecule, so it forms an uh, iron dipole. Um, it's not quite in the standard, you know, if you just simply talk about attractions between the water and the and the and the chloride. Okay, but going back to these, um, you must know the, no, I said ions can be nonpolar, but they're still charged. So ionic substances are ionic. You don't actually really refer to polar or nonpolar when you're talking about ionic. Um, Yes, we do when we're talking about shapes, because we're trying to teach you about shapes. Then we talk about, is this sort of iron or whatever, polar or nonpolar? But it's that's in a very uh, theoretical sense. So because I know in, in an ionic substance, you're not going to get just an iron by itself. A, an anion has to have a cation with it um, to balance. Okay. Okay. So ionic substances in level two, you may have may have come across some solubility rules, or you may have come across it in the 3.6 standard. Um, in the 3.4 uh, standard, they'll just tell you whether it dissolves or not. They won't actually expect you to know it. But in the 3.6, um, you do need to know a bit more about how things dissolve. Okay, usually the smaller the charge, the more likely it's going to dissolve. So, for instance, uh, sodium chloride's only got one positive and one negative charge. So, water can separate them because that attraction isn't very strong. But, say, uh, calcium carbonate, you've got a positive two and a negative two. So, that's like double the attraction between them. So, that's much harder to break apart. So, calcium carbonate is insoluble. Um, but we won't go there. <laughs> okay, back to here, because this is important and we're running out of time. <laughs> so the temporary dipole, you must always discuss the factors. And this is the size of the electron cloud, or, you know, how many electrons. Um, you can link to mass, but I've noticed that the examiners prefer more you talk about um electrons rather than mass. So you'll notice here, for instance, has a large electron cloud 
Okay, so because it's got a large electron cloud, there are stronger temporary dipole force of attraction. So whenever you're talking about temporary dipole force of attraction, you must talk about the electron cloud or how many electrons. Related to that is the molar mass, because the more, the greater the molar mass, the more electrons there are going to be. Okay. Um, also linked to the temporary dipole force of attraction is the shape. Now, we don't mean here trigonal, bipyramidal, or that sort of thing. Here we want to know, is it a round shape or is it a long, thin shape? Because anything that's long and thin, you can have uh, the long, thin ones coming close together, so they can form lots of attractions between them. Whereas if the, you've got round shapes, you know, there's a bigger distance in that part, so it's not going to attract as strongly, and that'll you know, this part, the closest part, they'll attract more strongly, but there's not as many as the long thin. So you've got to discuss the shape. Is it a long thin molecule or is it a round molecule? For permanent dipole force of attraction, the only thing that affects the size of a permanent dipole uh, is force of attraction is the permanent dipole. So you are not expected to know the exact size of the dipole, you know. Um, so you would just simply, unless they give it in some way, like they give you the dipole moment, which is a measure of the permanent dipole, you you can't really compare using that. But you can say this one is polar uh, molecule, and that one's non-polar. So this one will have temporary and permanent dipole force of attraction, whereas this one will only have temporary. But however, if this one that's only got temporary, if it's got lots of electrons, it can have a higher boiling point. So um, you may have it over here. So for example, uh, okay, here you compare, they've all, these two both have got hydrogen bonding. Now, I've just written H bonding, please you write hydrogen bonding. You can in brackets then after that say H bonding and then thereafter refer to H bonding, but the first time around you must say hydrogen bonding. So you've got hydrogen bonding because of that hydrogen, because of that hydrogen. This cannot form hydrogen bonds because the hydrogen is not attached to an electronegative element. It's attached to carbon, which is not electronegative enough. Uh, so this will have no H bonding. So this one's only got temporary uh, dipole and permanent dipole. These have got all three types, temporary, permanent, and hydrogen bonding. So you have to discuss the factors. So uh, this has got a lower, needs less energy, and it's probably due to the hydrogen bonding, but please refer to also this one's got four carbons plus an oxygen. This one's actually a horrible one to do because you've got, you can't compare the weights very easily or the number of electrons. Uh, but this one's definitely got more electrons than this one. So therefore this one will have more temporary di dipole force of attraction than that one. This one has way more than this one because this one's got five carbons and so on. Okay, uh, all right. I can see I'm going to go, have to go a lot, lot faster um, when I do this again just before the exams. Okay, so that definitely look at those answers and notice how they always discuss the temporary and the permanent. And they talk about how, how whether the electron cloud is bigger or not. Um, and so similar size, therefore we have similar temporary dipole forces of attraction or of similar strength, et cetera. Um, so make those statements. Um, here it's again, you, know, you can see this definitely comes up a lot. <clears throat> right, now uh, the other thing you need to know, I'm actually going to just, uh, with is, is entropy, which always goes up to excellence level as well. And what you've always got to do here is think of your entropy increases when you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, because a solid is more ordered, 
a liquid is less ordered, a gas is even less ordered. So the more disorder, the more entropy. And it's also solid to aqueous generally, not always, but you can say generally, will also have an increase in entropy. So always look at this to see what happens with the entropy. If I'm going from um, solid to aqueous, just assume that it's going to be um, more entropy. As I say, it's not all the time, but most of the time. So you've got to talk about that. Then you've got to also think of the heat. And now you've got to look at the reaction and what's happening in the surroundings. So we talk about the system and the surroundings. So in the system, because this is positive, what's happening, um, this is losing, oh, sorry, this is cooling down. And if something cools down, it's not moving around as fast, and therefore it's getting more ordered. So here the entropy is now decreasing in the system. Okay, but it's because it's, you know, there's a gain in energy, okay, because that means it's the gain has happened. The only way it can gain energy is by sucking it out of the system. Okay, um, so that will also decrease the entropy over there. So look both at the how heat affects the entropy as well as uh, are we going from fewer molecules to more molecules okay we are going from one substance to two substances so that means an increase in entropy and we've got also solid to aqueous which means an increase in entropy so this is bigger than the effect on the heat and Therefore, this reaction is spontaneous. You must have an increase in entropy for a reaction to be spontaneous. So if they say, the react, why is the reaction spontaneous? If you just simply state this, that the entropy of the system increases. Um, oh, okay, normally they often just simply say, therefore, it's spontaneous. <laughs> That's normally a tick, but now I see here in 2021, they want a little bit more detail. So if it's going from one to two, OK, or it's going from uh, solid to aqueous. You'll get that tick. Any questions on that? So you'll find with all of these, always think of the system, what's happening in the reaction in terms of heat, as well as in terms of change of ions or number of ions, or uh, what's happening to the surroundings. So here, for example, is we're going from a solid to a gas. So we've got three particles here, two particles there. Um, we're not going to worry about the split, OK, because um, that gets complicated. But the fact we're going from a solid to a gas means that there's going to be definitely an increase in entropy. So is entropy of the overall system always positive? Yes. So of the overall, the system and surroundings combined must be positive. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the overall, if we included the system and surroundings together, they must both overall together be positive. So one can be negative and the other one more positive, making them both overall more positive. But you can't have one being negative and the other one being negative as well. OK. Sorry, I am uh, I meant to go to Hess's law as well. So I'll just go five more minutes, if you don't mind. Um, with Hess's law, which is the next one that will come up. As you can see, that it, there'll always be something in entropy. Oh, here's something on heating curves. It came up in 2020, and that's the only time it actually came up. I think it came up one more time in 2015 or around about there. Uh, like, it could come up in 2022, but uh, so read this and see if you can understand it, um, but it otherwise doesn't come up very often. Now, this enthalpy type questions are quite easy achieve points um, but they relate really to Hess's law with Hess's law 
for the short term, uh, a short form of calculation. You know, where you say um, the delta H is the heat of the products subtract the sum of the heat of the reactants. That only works if you've got heat of formation. If you are not given the heat of formation, do not use that shortcut. Always use the long version, okay? Like over here, this is what we call the long version. So because we had delta RH, delta RH, delta RH. So we cannot use the shortcut version. Um, they give you the formula of the in the resource booklet. So let's do an example. Um, the shortcut version normally is achieved going up to merit. The long tends to go definitely merit, sometimes excellence. Um, where's an example? Here. Here's an example. So it's formation and formation. Okay. Um, you've got to calculate the heat of formation of this. This is not a formation, but basically that one is going to be equal to the sum of all the others, your unknown plus the other two. So don't use the shortcut version. This is the shortcut version. They didn't spell out the formula first, but that's the shortcut version unless you've got heats of formation. And then one final thing I want to say with the last calculation, I know I'm rushing this. So this is the shortcut version. Notice you can use it because you've only got heats of formation. If you don't have heats of formation, don't use it. So here's another one, heats of formation, so you can. Um, right. Um, okay, let's go over here. With this, just make sure you, when you've got to do the thermochemical calculations, they give you these formulae. So please use them. They are given in the resource booklet. So when you look at this, go right, that is delta T. Okay, I need to calculate M. So what's also given, you're also given this equation, although you're given it as N is equal to small m over big M. You are given um, the specific heat capacity. So you must know that C over here is the specific heat capacity. Um, you are given the mass of the nitrate solution, which is different to the mass of that. Uh, so that potassium nitrate is that M over there. Okay, and then this over here is for that. So if you highlight everything, say, very clearly in your head or on the paper what all of these stand for, all you have to do now is go, right, What? which of these four, three formula can I start off with? Well, with this one, I know M, I know C, and I know delta T, so I can calculate Q. Right, I've got Q, what can I do next? Okay, so that's the sort of thing you can uh, work out. Um, okay, so, yep. Pretty much, it's always three significant figures. If in doubt, always do three significant figures. And yes, only round off at the end. Um, when you're doing Hess's law, um, notice, because we're only adding and subtracting, um, we use more than three, OK? Um, because we're just simply adding them up. But for the calculations where we're multiplying and dividing, these are all multiplying and dividing, you look at the least number of significant figures. And if it's a good paper, they will make sure that they're all at least three significant figures. All of these are given to three significant figures. So your final answer must be three significant figures. But I found you'll, um, they now accept a greater variety. Uh, simply because sometimes they do go wrong in the exam paper and they might give something to two significant figures somewhere. And so the people that know what to do, you know, change the answer and then it gets remarked and then you realize, hey, it's, it's got to be at a higher significant figure. Okay, we're way over time. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, my final sort of things to you is, 
I'll email this out again with a correction where I swapped those two answers. Go through the answers and look at the wording and see what comes up again and again. And then you just practice how to write that type of answer. Um, and you'll get at least an achieved if you started off with knowing nothing. If you really know more or less what to do, you can just tweak your answers to get to, you know, look your merit or your excellence level. Any final questions? Right, okay, so I will um, send an email out either later today or tomorrow with a recording plus the link to uh, the organic as well. Okay. I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>